so good morning and thank you everyone for being here today. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Cecilia Lunardini, who's been visiting us for the past few weeks. Uh, Cecilia uh, completed her PhD uh, in 2001 from the International School of Advanced Studies uh, in Trieste, Italy. Uh, she was then a member here for three years before completing her postdoctoral work at the University of Washington. Uh, she then joined the faculty of Arizona State University, where she's currently a full professor. Also mentioned that she was in 2020 named a fellow of the American Physical Society for her work on nuclear and neutrino astrophysics. Uh, her work um, that she's going to tell us about today uh, concerns the uh, potential neutrinos from tidal disruption events. And thank you very much for joining us. Take it away. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I hope I hope you can hear me. I know I know my tone of voice is a bit low. Um, I'll do my best. Um, thank you for hosting me here at the AAS. I'm happy to be back after a long time. Um, so here is my title, High Energy Neutrinos from Tidal Disruption Events, or TDE. So I plan to spend quite a bit of time giving an introduction on TDEs as particle accelerators, give some theory essentials, and also some basics on how we can detect neutrinos from TDEs. And then I will um, discuss how we may have already detected neutrinos from TDEs. There are some interesting observations uh, that show a temporal and spatial associations uh, um, some TDEs. So I'll show these observations and then uh, I will finally uh, show a little bit of my work on interpreting these observations uh, in a sort of a unified manner. And then finish with summary and discussion. Um, I'm including a disclaimer here. Uh, you will see that there is so much diverse science going into this uh, topic. And so I'm approaching it from the point of view of a particle physicist, because I'm a particle physicist. Um, so it's pretty much a neutrino particle physics perspective. I may not have all the answers to astronomy questions. OK, so TDEs as particle accelerate. This is probably unnecessary, but just in case, let's review what is a tidal disruption event. It's, uh, you can think of it as a merger of a star and a supermassive black hole. Um, and um, if the black hole is below a few 10 to the 7 solar masses and the star passes sufficiently close to it, the star will be uh, shredded by the tidal forces before being eventually accreted. So uh, you should imagine the star being disrupted and then having this, this debris coming out. And then a fraction of the debris will remain bound to the black hole and be accreted and that uh, causes a flare. So uh, the basic physics was worked out in the 1980s already. It's pretty simple. Uh, the idea is that the flare luminosity will roughly track the rate of mass accretion and uh, the, the flare should last for as long as the luminosity stays above the Eddington luminosity and then fade afterwards. And this, this reasoning leads to estimating the duration of the flare to be between uh, a few months and a few years. So it's, these are long transients. And we have seen many of them, uh, of the order of 100 flares from TDEs have been observed and in, many, in different wavelengths, and we expect to have many more uh, in the years to come. So it's kind of a blossoming field. Um, so here is a picture of the possible um, complex uh, uh, structure of a TD after the disruption has occurred. So there will be the central uh, black hole um, and there will be an accretion disk uh, emitting in optical UV and X-rays. And there could be other elements as well. For example, there could be a jet. There are uh, some jet TDs that have been observed. There could be a hot corona similar to AGN. Um, the stellar debris could uh, form streams that may intersect and collide. Um, there could be an outflow and 
there, is, there are some observations of TDEs having a lot of dust uh, near them. And here you see the scale of distances from 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 17 centimeters. Um, I want to uh, stress the role of the dust here because it's important for what comes next. Um, so if there is a dust torus, uh, the dust will absorb the X-rays and optical UV from the accretion disk and re-emit the energy in infrared. And because of the geometry of the system you see here, this is this, this will be an echo. The infrared photons will arrive in a certain way compared to the primary ones from the accretion disk. So TDEs uh, have been proposed as uh, cosmic ray accelerators already several years ago um, because they meet the basic requirement for like, accelerating protons or nuclei to ultra high energies. Uh, so some of you may recognize this. This is the so-called Hilla's condition, which is usually graphically represented as the Hilla's plot, which you see here. Is this basically says that if you have a candidate source, um, the source has to be, and you want it to be a particle accelerated to high energy, um, the size of the source has to be bigger than the power of the source. So, um, that's that's basically what this is, and so uh, you can see here the scales required to produce a ten to the twenty EV uh, uh, protons, and this is the graphical representation of this condition. The sources that are on this line are good candidates. You see there are several new stars, AGN, and here are TDEs. Um, this is of course a very rough criterion. And um, there have been more detailed studies which show that um, particle acceleration can occur in many different ways in a TV. So the previous, the previous, previous cartoon that you have seen in the previous slide, uh, all these various elements can pretty much host particle acceleration, the jet, the corona, accretion disk itself, colliding streams, um, outflow, um, and so on. So what is the, the basis for the magnetic field estimate? Um, magnetic field uh, typically goes. For what basis? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know that. Um, I, from the literature, I remember maybe you know, 10 to a gauss to a gauss. This is the value swing, you know. But the origin of that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. Um, okay. So, um, more specifically, um, neutrinos from TDEs. If TDEs are proton or nuclei accelerators, we should have neutrinos uh, from them because neutrinos are a byproduct of uh, the uh, interactions of these, uh, these uh, charged particles. So if you have accelerated protons, proton, it can scatter off a background photon or proton and produce a, a hadronic cascade. And inside the cascade, there will be pions, charged pions, which decay, uh, go through a decay uh, chain, which ultimately leads to neutrinos. So this new, mu and new E are muon and then have neutrinos, and you can have also their contact particles in the, in the cascade. Um, several literature has shown that they predict the neutrino flux from a TDE can be detectable at the ice cube uh, experiment. And here is just an illustration of the affluence expected uh, for different uh, models corresponding to different acceleration scenarios. Um, this is just for illustration, and you can see by eye the comparison with these two horizontal lines, um, which represent roughly the sensitivity of ice cube um, for two different um, technical, uh, for two different types of uh, uh, operations, different modes of operation. So you see, we are, not, we are not too far. And of course, there are uncertainties in each of these models. So this is, this is all for motivation. And uh, I want to say a few words about IceCube. Um, IceCube has detected astrophysical, extragalactic, high energy neutrinos for more than 10 years now. It's a very successful experiment. It's basically 
one kilometer cube of ice, Antarctic ice, which has been instrumented um, with these strings, which are uh, uh, which contain these digital optical modules. And these modules are, um, are sensitive to electromagnetic showers. And this is how uh, the detector uh, observes the streams. So um, this perhaps is, is more than, than that's needed, but I, I think it's interesting. Um, these are two different topologies of what I call an event in the detector. An event is uh, when a neutrino enters the detector and interacts. Uh, so there are two basic uh, possibilities here. One is a, the so-called shower-like or cascade-like event where a neutrino of any type interacts with a, a big, uh, with a, a nucleus and produces a cascade. You can see here these colors correspond to time. So the cascade can develops from early time to late times. And um, this, this type of cascade uh, can be uh, measured pretty well. We can reconstruct the total energy in the cascade um, pretty well, 10% or so accuracy. Um, and also ice cube is a, is a, a full sky detector. It can, it's in principle sensitive to neutrinos from the entire sky because neutrinos um, are not absorbed. Um, by matter, and so we can detect them from, from uh, every direction. And this process occurs for all types of neutrinos. This other topology is called track-like, and this is more interesting for this talk, because these are events uh, are um, a subset which where you have a mu or neutrino interact with the nucleus, and it produces a cascade which contains a charged muon. And this charged muon has a visible track which can be reconstructed by the uh, by the strings and uh, um, so thanks to the presence of this new on track uh, we can reconstruct the um, arrival direction of the neutrino pretty well is the timing good enough to see the time development um yeah they can see the time development so the colors correspond to time so actually the 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 shower the track develops from here to here, so it kind of goes this way. And there are some fun movies of that show the how this goes with time. So it's uh, it, it has time. Yeah. How how do you uh, figure out that this track was originated by a neutrino, or not some other part starting the shelf? Um, I guess the ones that are coming from down. Through the earth. Okay, so how do we know that this was a neutrino and not another particle? Um, well, first of all, you need to have a, a, a lepton coming in. So, in order to have a lepton, you know, this has to be a leptonic shower in order to have the muon. So, you have to have a lepton. Uh, so, what else could produce a leptonic shower? It could be an atmospheric muon or a cosmic muon. Cosmic muons are vetoed before they reach the detector, there is an outside veto where they can see the muons coming in. So if they see the muons coming in, they, they veto the event. And if it's an atmospheric neutrino, uh, this is difficult to discriminate. But if the energy is sufficiently high, the flux of atmospheric neutrinos declines so fast that beyond, say, a few hundreds of TeVs, um, most of the events would be astrophysical just on the basis of the second thing of the flux being low. So um, elaborating on this uh, uh, angular resolution, in the next slide, I want to show how these track-like events are used for, um, for astrophysical alerts, for astronomical alerts. So um, IceCube collects track, these track-like events that have energy sufficiently high uh, say 100 TV or higher. So there is a confidence that they are of astrophysical origin. And um, it, it, it has the capability of generating fast alerts, in particular, less than a minute or at most a few minutes from the actual detection. There is, uh, they release automated alerts um, to the community where they provide basic information for follow up, uh, namely the signalness so-called signalness and localization, which is typically um, a few square degrees. 
And uh, signalless is um, something which is explained here. It's, it's, there are these two labels, gold and bronze. Gold are the best candidate events because they are uh, estimated uh, to have at least a 50% probability of being astrophysical. And bronze are slightly less uh, good somehow events because they are one. They have about one uh, in in three. Well, about one in three of them is um, probably astrophysical. Um, these are the number of alerts. By uh, astrophysical, you mean not atmospheric? Yes, not background. It's not atmospheric. Um, these are the number of alerts that Ice Cube has issued every year as a function of the year. And now we are at the level of having almost 100 uh, of these alerts every year. And every time there is an alert, it can be used for follow up by major telescopes that can go and look in that patch of the sky uh, to find can candidate sources. So this has been very successful. Um, sorry, sorry, this may be a silly question, but on that plot, so you explained the gold and the bronze, but what is the um, the colors. Um, yeah, these are, uh, it's kind of technical. These are, uh, it's called HISI, uh, which means uh, high energy starting events. So this is an older classification oh. that they still retain for like historical purposes. But but the, 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 the orange are these gold and bronze, which is the more modern classification. Um, yeah. Um, so they have, they have various descriptors that allow them to tell us how likely, how good an event is, how likely it is to be an astrophysicist. So these are cumulative numbers, it's not per year or anything? Um, total number of events since they started? So, um, let's see, I think these might be actually, I'm not sure, I believe this might be per year. Um, because they have a lot of these. Um, so, yeah, 100 a year means one every three days. That sounds like a lot. Um, uh, okay, so I, I would have to check. Um, I know it's many, many, they issue many, especially because these bronze ones are relatively frequent. So I get emails every time they have one and I, I get them a lot, but yeah, this might be now I'm wondering if these are cumulative numbers, but certainly ten, many a year, maybe tens uh, per year for sure, for sure are issued. Yeah. Are there any galactic sources that might uh, contaminate? Um, yes, actually, um, very recently Ice Cube has um, published uh, a result where they see evidence of a galactic flux. Um, but it's, it's very small, it's a minor uh, contributor to the total flux. So it's um, mostly yeah. atmospheric. It's, it's the main, um, main other flux present in the detector is atmospheric. <clears throat> so because these are events that have localization, you can see where they come from. You can see they come from outside the galaxy, just on the basis of the position in the sky. Um, so yeah, but there is a small flux from the galaxy that has been missing. Okay. Um, so um, I have some references for later use. Um, and let me now talk about um, these neutrino TDs associations that have been reported. Um, this is this is an interesting compilation. I made it for this talk. I was I, I found out about some of these uh, uh, events just while preparing this talk. So there are eight um, neutrino TD associations that have been reported in various ways in various channels. And uh, by by this association, I mean that uh, there are eight neutrinos for which. Uh, a TDE was identified as a likely source, a likely counterpart on the basis of time and position. And you what see- What choice of time is being made because then like what range of times co constitutes a coincidence? 
So the time is, uh, these are long flares. They last maybe for a year or two years. And so um, typically the neutrinos are, the, you will see they are detected maybe a few hundreds of days after the peak of the flare. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is an, a formal time cut. I don't think, I don't think um, there is a unified, uh, there hasn't been a unified search where constraints were put on the, on the time. But um, uh, you'll see that these associations are pretty clear because the arrival time of the neutrino is well within the duration of the flare. And uh, uh, I don't want to spoil, but you'll see later on that they kind of make sense um, in terms of time. Um, and position, since we are mentioning time and position, um, these are, uh, there is one of them that has a weak positional coincidence, but all the other ones are within the 90% localization uh, uh, region uh, provided by the ice cube. And you said that was a few degrees? Yes. So at like redshift. Just square degree. At redshift of 0.27, that's, that's good for. Yeah, how know. many TDs do you per square yeah. degree per in a year or yeah. something? Um, yes, so the question here is what else there is, what else there is at that, in such a large uh, uh, region. Um, I cannot give a very detailed answer, but I can say that um, there have been alternate explanations for these associations. So um, I think there have been claims of maybe um, um, a supernova origin or so people have looked at alternate alternatives and they have found some. Um, but um, so, okay, so this is still kind of um, all being organized and so it's still it's still something that's evolving and not not everything is is absolutely rigorous so uh, partly because of that i will focus on the top three um uh, tds 80 2019 dsg 80 2019 fdr and 80 2019 alc um the first two were ztf follow-ups from ice cube alerts and the third one has been found uh, in, uh, not in real time in some sort of archival search involving uh, ZTF and new ones. Um, and since we are talking about alternate explanations, out of these three objects, two of them, um, the whole, in two cases, the host of the flare uh, was an AGM. So one alternate explanation is AGM flares. Uh, even, though, even though the scale of luminosity is higher, than a typical AGM flare, but the explanation, the interpretation has been put forward. Why is the next <coughs> simultaneous the golden bronze? Because it's two different neutrinos. So these are two different neutrinos, one gold, one bronze, that have been found to coincide with this uh, flare. And then and then this these three down here, SDSS, blah blah blah, these are infra, they were in, identified as infrared. Flares and they didn't have an optical UV counterpart. Should I be surprised that they're all 2019? <laughs> all in 2019, yes. Um, so CTF is working, uh, Ice Cube is working on that. What's going on? Or is they they only released up to a certain date? Um, there might be. So these were real time alerts. This one was found in post processing. Uh, so there is, there is part of the reason might be that people are still searching through the data. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of remarkable that these two were two follow-ups, both in 2019. And yeah, so there is, there is that aspect, yeah. Okay, um, I think I can move on. Uh, to me, it's impressive how detailed the observations are on some of these TVs. So this is uh, the second one of the list, 80, 80 2019 FDR. And uh, probably the most in interesting is the bottom plot where you see the luminosity curve here in green is the um, optical UV from ZTF. And then um, 
these dark markers here are the infrared. Um, and then this teal color down here are X-rays. So there was a one late X-ray detection, the other points are upper limits. And um, this is something I didn't want to spoil earlier. This is the arrival time of the neutrino. And since you were asking about the arrival time, you see it's um, um, for sure more than 200 days. Um, and it's, it, it's close to the peak of the infrared. Just kind of interrupt. Um, so you see here up here spectra from certain time intervals. Um, they are well fit by a double um, black body spectrum, one for the infrared and one for the optical. So you were mentioning this was a follow up? Yes. So um, what happened is that Ice Cube issued an alert corresponding to the neutrino, and then ZTF uh, looked and uh, found this TDE as uh, as a possible counterpart uh, because it was in the flaring state when the neutrino was detected. But it was already being observed before. So you see, there is data from prior prior to the neutrino arrival. So, so I think the neutrino detection was uh, uh, prompted for more observations uh, uh, after this. Yeah, so this, what, this was not discovered because of the neutrino, it was already known, but it was identified as a counterpart. So I have another interesting uh, set of plots. Um, and the reason I'm showing these plots is because when we started having more than one, we had DSG, FDR, and ALK, we started looking, coinciding with neutrinos, we started looking for patterns. We started to see if there was a common denominator that would link the three of them, some sort of special feature that's special to all of them that's not common in the general TDE population. And uh, what we found, what we saw is that they are unusually bright in X-rays compared to the average population. They are unusually bright in the infrared, very strong dust echoes um, shown here. Okay. And uh, uh, also for the so three of them. Unusually bright relative to what? Relative to the optical flux or? Uh, so bright uh, relative to how normally the dust echo is for the hundreds of so TDs that we have. Uh, but yes, people typically quantify the brightness as uh, the ratio between the infrared and the, and the optical uh, peak. So, so basically the magnitude of these dust echoes is considered unusual compared to what's considered common for a TD. Um, so these uh, dense, points are the uh, optical UV from ZTF, and these less dense markers are the infrared. And also you see that for the three objects, also the time of arrival of, the, of arrival of the neutrino, which is the vertical line, kind of suggests a proximity to the peak of the infrared, which, which attracted our attention. So this is too detailed. Um, if you have any curiosity about, about anything specific, uh, here is all the metric. Uh, maybe I can take the opportunity to say two things here. One is that out of the three objects, FDR, AT2019 FDR was the one with uh, by far the largest redshift. So this is a lot farther out than the other two. And also, if you're wondering about statistical significance, there are two analyses, one by Van Velsen et al, where they find a 3.7 sigma um, um, significance for these neutrino TDs associations, these three. And then the Ice Cube collaboration did their own analysis, uh, which is consistent with Van Velsen et al, um, even though the conclusions were perhaps uh, a little more conservative in terms of how they interpret it. Uh, the significance that they found. So, um, I mean, which of those was AGN? Right. Which yeah. ones were AGN? Yeah. Um, FDR and ALK. So, out of the three, I think the community kind of agrees that DSG was a TD. The other two, because they had an AGN host, 
it's a bit more debatable. Some people have suggested an exceptionally bright AGM flow. Is the mass consistent with what we observe? Like, do, do you need a spin for these black holes, high spin or something? Um, it's not necessary to explain the observations to evoke a spin from the black hole. Um, I have examined theoretical papers where people look at the effect of the spin of the black hole on a TV, and the effect is not big. Um, I remember that one effect was that the maximum mass for, to have uh, disruption can be larger than the value of quoted earlier of say, 3, 10 to the 7 solar mass. Um, but, but, these, oops, but these masses are all consistent with uh, spinless black holes. It also depends yeah. on the star you're trying to disrupt. And yes, it's, that's true. So moving on, um, again, references for those who are interested. So, so let's start to think about interpretations of these observations. And what I want to say here is that given how much detail we have uh, on these three objects um, in terms of uh, having time-dependent, multi-wavelength, uh, 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 light curves, and spectra, and so on, um, from dedicated companies. We have so much information that we can we are in the position of attempting a unified explanation and uh, look for underlying physical model that can explain uh, uh, is uh, TV is being. So the, the spirit here that I'm suggesting is uh, taking what we know from strong, taking the photon luminosities and spectra as inputs. Can we construct a model that will uh, explain, that will agree somehow with uh, the fact that we have detected the neutrinos from TV rooms? So this is where I start to talk about my work. This is work in collaboration with Walter Winter and this is Oiten, a paper from last year. Um, so we have were curious about these neutrinos from TVs, and so even though the explanations of these flares is uh, subject to interpretation, we decided to believe that these three are TDEs. Let's assume they are TDEs, and let's assume that the neutrino associations are real, so that these are the parent sources of the three uh, associated neutrinos. And we also, we were looking for a unified explanation, so we assume that there is a uh, there is a neutrino production mechanism at play, which is the same for three of them. And we focused on P-gamma interactions as the origin of these neutrinos. Uh, this is typically the primary mechanism in many uh, similar sources. Um, we have included PP as well in the, in the results, but I will um, um, focus more on P-gamma. So here is how the exercise worked. Um, the, the goal was to compute the time-dependent neutrino fluences or fluxes. Uh, so we have a numerical code, um, which is called a new Cosma, which does this. And it does this uh, by taking uh, inputs, which we infer from the data we have. So we have photospectra, photoluminosities from observations. We use them as inputs uh, with a number of assumptions, some of which I will uh, detail. And then we, we can choose what dominant, what, what, we, what we want to have as the dominant photon target. We can build a model where the X-rays are the main target or the optical UV are targets or the infrared. And you'll see what we get in each case. And then basically given this, this setup, we compute the predicted neutrino luminosities and fluences, and we see if they reproduce the observed um, energy of the detected neutrino and the arrival time. So as I said, we um, are the, the primary mechanism for neutrino production is P gamma interaction. So let's say more about what we do for protons and Photons, what our 
what are our minimal assumptions. Um, so for photoluminosities, we add the, add the emission, okay, so before there is any absorption on the way to Earth. Um, we model the infrared luminosity from the dust echo, uh, where we use the data and also we feed the data using our own uh, toy model for, for the echo. And then for the X-ray luminosities, we had to be a bit more aggressive in assumptions because they are fairly sparse. And so based on theoretical papers, we assumed uh, uh, luminosity in the X-rays, which is nearly constant or very slowly decaying over the hundreds of days of the flare. Um, this is not immediately in agreement with observations because observations show some variability. So we assumed that uh, this variability can be due to propagation effects, maybe some time-dependent obscuration effects. Um, and finally, for the optical UV luminosity, which we call LBB, L black body, uh, we took the time profile from the data, but um, we are aware of absorption effects, extinction, and so we um, made our best attempt to infer the true produced uh, black body luminosities from the dust echo. So this is something I did and I enjoy. Uh, the dust echo tells you how much uh, luminosity you should have uh, in, in uh, optical UV. So we did that, and that's, that's what's how we scale up compared to the observed luminosity. Uh, and then for protons, for protons, we had to assume something. Obviously, this is not something we detect. So uh, we considered an isotropic model. So this is not a jetted model. There are jetted models on the market. This is not one of them. We assume isotropic acceleration. And we are kind of agnostic about the acceleration mechanism. We assume, we consider that there should be some acceleration according to literature that supports that. And so we take a phenomenological description for the protoluminosity as um, evolving similarly to the black body luminosity. And uh, we take it, we set it to be 20 times the ending to luminosity at the peak, which is motivated by um, some fairly advanced numerical models. There is this unified TV model by uh, Dai et al, for example. And then for the proton spectrum, we took a classic e to the minus two spectrum, which is typical of these of many acceleration models, uh, with a cutoff, um, which is important. Uh, the cutoff has to be above a PV, but you will see you will see more about what we do with this cutoff in the in the next slides. What does the luminosity mean? The protons are confined by magnetic field, so they're not leaving. So yes, what do what do you mean by luminosity? So um, yes, yeah, so I I. This, this will be clarified in the next few slides. Um, we mean, you can, you can think of luminosity as uh, how much energy in protons your, your central engine is You're adding emitting. And you add, yes, it's the, the amount of energy in protons that you are injecting into your system. But then, as you said, it's different from the, full, the proton density and how it evolves with time, because protons will be confined. And that's coming in the next uh, slides. Yeah. Do you have any polar metric data? Um, I'm not sure. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I don't think so, but I do. <laughs> so your numbers, the number of protons is dominated by lowest energy as well? Uh, yes. So, so yes, because we take this spectrum. The, so what do you assume for how much mass do these protons are? What's uh, the, the Lorentz factor of uh, lowest energy protons? Um, well, um, I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, are you asking if we take a lower energy cutoff or? Yes, or I mean, the bulk of protons are yeah. Are the low energy ones? So I'm just wondering, yeah, yeah, how much protons are assumed to be? Yeah. So we checked. We checked if these conditions made sense in terms of not exceeding the total mass of that that's accreted. 
Um, and we check that we are far from that. So if you take a solar mass star and um, you assume that maybe half of it is ultimately accreted by the black hole, um, then you get an energy of something like 10 to the 54 Ergs. And then if you take these luminosities and you integrate them, um, you are way below that. Um, so it's probably maybe a, a percent uh, of, of that mass. Um, so, um, and you would also see that the low energy cutoff doesn't really matter because um, the low energy protons don't really contribute much to the uh, produced neutrino flux. So we, 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 did, we were not in the position of having to set a low energy cutoff. So, yes. do you expect proton proton um, collisions to be relevant for neutrino productions? Or is um, that underdominant? It's subdominant, but depending on, we have three models. In some of the models, it's um, relatively important. I have I have results too. So yeah, so we were mostly driven by P gamma, but PP is included and it causes some contribution of low energy. So I have results for that. Um, so some of these questions will be probably clarified by the next few slides. Uh, before you get there, let me just say uh, a few words about P gamma interaction. So P gamma is um, uh, the main mechanism, and uh, the cross-section is dominated by the delta resonance, and that means that um, in order to meet the delta resonance, the product of the photon and proton energies have to uh, uh, be equal to the square of the mass of the delta particle, and that means that the lower the average energy of your photons, the lower temperature, uh, the higher the proton energy required to meet the resonance. And uh, uh, so this is the first point. And then the second point is that the neutrinos typically take 1% of the energy of the parent protons. And so if you put these two conditions together, what you get is that lower uh, photon spectrum, uh, colder photon spectrum, implies that your result, your produced neutrinos will be more energetic. So uh, just to give a scale, if, it, if you want average internal energy of 100 TeV, you need a photon temperature around 80 eV, which is in the X-ray uh, range. Um, very briefly, we the code that we used solves a set of coupled differential equations, which track the evolution of the number density of the particle species. Um, you have to include injection, cooling, escape. And here I just want to make a very simple point that your P gamma interaction has to be more efficient than the proton escape. So the protons have to interact efficiently uh, before they, uh, they escape, either by free stream or diffusion. So I'm Time is going fast, so I'm going to show maybe two extreme models. We have three, but I'm going to show off two. Um, let's see the model where the X-rays are the dominant target. Uh, so X-rays come out of the accretion disk, and um, somewhere not far from the accretion disk, it's maybe in the outflow, protons will be accelerated, so we take a, a, a a radial distance of about a few 10 to the 15 centimeters for our radiation zone where the neutrinos are produced. And the X-rays will interact with the protons, produce neutrinos that way. Uh, so X-rays are the dominant targets on the basis of the previous slide. We see that this works well because X-rays are in the right, the temperature is in the right range to produce TeV neutrinos. And we can do that as long as our cutoff for the protons is sufficiently high, a few PEVs. If you are below a few PEVs, then you don't have, uh, you don't have, uh, uh, the delta resonance is not met uh, for, for X-rays. Uh, important point that you were mentioning earlier, the protons, so here the system is actually thin to P gamma, uh, we check that. 
And so it's essential to have a calorimetric behavior which is ensured by the magnetic field. So if we, we take one Gauss magnetic field, the protons will gyrate, stay confined, and that's how we uh, ensure that there is efficient neutrino uh, uh, production uh, uh, from these protons. And we find that the in-source proton density builds up over 100 days. So this probably is going to be clearer with these plots. Um, these are the results. The result is the pink curve. This is the neutrino luminosity and neutrino fluence. And everything else is input. These curves are input. This is what I call the proton luminosity, the, the energy in protons injected in the system. But this line here is the one that takes into account. This is the in-source proton density taking into account that the protons will stay confined in the surface. So there is this buildup. And together with a relatively flat X-ray uh, luminosity curve, we have a relatively gently falling neutrino luminosity, which explains the time of arrival, which is consistent, say, with the time of arrival of um, more than 200 days uh, post-peak for the neutrino. Um, the energy, Average energy of the neutrinos is also in agreement with the absurd one, which is this arrow here with the error in given by the shaded band, you see we are kind of on target here. The problem here is that the predicted number of events that I skew is low. So how many neutrinos could this object have produced according to this model? Not that many, uh, maybe 0 0.08 per TD uh, according to this model, which is not much. This curve is the level where you have to be to have one neutrino predicted in your detector. So we are kind of below, below. Uh, because time is going quickly, I'm going to uh, go quickly on the next few slides. These are the results for the other two TDs. So the one I showed in the previous slide is for 18, 2019 FDR. You can see the results for the other two objects. Um, there are some qualitative differences, quantitative differences, but qualitatively, um, the results are similar. And if you're wondering why for ALF we have such a higher number of neutrinos predicted in the detector is because this one is the closest to us. It's just a distance effect. So I'm skipping the second scenario where the optical UV photon is the main target, and I'm going directly to the third scenario where the main targets are the infrared photons, which I'm particularly fond of because there is a connection with the dust table here. So here is the idea. The idea is that you, we, you, we could have um, a situation where protons are accelerated some, somewhere not too far from the dust, uh, from where the dust is, so maybe um, a few 10 to the 16 centimeters or 10 to the 17 centimeters, which is the estimated dust torus radius. Um, and if we want the infrared photons to be the main target, then the temperature is much lower than X-rays, and that means we need a much higher energy for the protons, which is a challenge for the model, perhaps. We need at least 5, 10 to the 3 PV uh, maximum uh, energy for the protons. Assuming that this is um, realized, then we can have efficient collisions of protons with infrared photons uh, producing neutrinos. Um, and, um, we checked the thickness. This, in this case, uh, the, uh, the system is moderately thick and moderately calorimetric. So there is an interplay of thickness and uh, uh, duration due to the magnetic field, which we take to be 0.1 Gauss. How strong does your magnetic field have to be to get a uh, 10 to the 3? Excellent question. Um, so we checked that. We just check the ba very basics uh, from the Hilla's condition mm -hmm. by putting in, say, 10 to the 17 centimeters. And uh, if I recall, it's, it's, we can get this, uh, but it's probably extreme in terms of acceleration efficiencies and so on. Um, this is something that would deserve a detailed investigation. 
but you don't remember the magnetic field values. Uh, the point one Gauss is that is that field strength. I yes. think that's for, but that's to. Sure. So that's the mag magnetic field here to keep the proton. Is that to keep them or just to make yeah? But do you could have the proton acceleration somewhere deeper inside mm -hmm. where the magnetic field could be stronger, and um, so we did. The estimation checking if this is plausible using the Hilas condition. Yeah. And, um, certainly, you need more than this. Uh, I don't recall right now how much you need, but um, it, I remember it was not overly high. But we can, it's something that would have to be investigated, especially because we didn't consider things like acceleration efficiency and so on. So, for the purpose of this study, we just did some basic check and we concluded it's reasonable. But, um, should probably pay more attention to that. So you see here the same figure for this model. And uh, uh, again, the result is the pink line, the neutrino luminosity, and others, the other curves are our inputs. Uh, you see here the calorimetric effect is moderate, is not extremely strong. And the main feature that you see here is that the neutrino luminosity is close to the infrared luminosity because of the way the model is constructed. And so it, it explains, it reproduces the delayed arrival of the neutrinos very well. Um, there are two tensions, however, one of them is the spectrum, because as I said, lower temperature results in more energetic neutrino spectrum. So the, our predicted neutrino spectrum is very energetic. And it's only, um, let's say, moderately consistent with the detected neutrino energy, which was estimated to be um, um, maybe around um, uh, 200 TeV or so. And it's very uncertain. So this is, you can see the shaded line is uncertainty. But still, the peak of the fluence is outside of this region. And also, we still have the problem that the predicted number of events at ice cube is uh, relatively low, and that's because um, in this model the density of infrared photons um, is is low, that that far out uh, from the from the center. So the yeah, results in the other two TDs, and since you were asking about PP uh, contributions, um, these lines, this line here is the contribution of proton proton scattering. Um, so it contributes a little bit here. Where does the density come from? That you assume for um, for PP, we estimated the outflow density. Um, yeah, I I I I cannot give you a number. I would have to ask my collaborator. But yeah, so this one is probably something that is subject to uncertainty depending on how much background density you assume. It could be it could be a lot higher. So this summarizes the features I have already said, so I think I'm going to skip it. Um, you may wonder, like we did, um, what does this model predict for the diffuse flux? Because we consider some specific TDs, but what about the diffuse flux? So um, I did the calculation taking some, taking these fluxes that we calculated for the individual, three individual TDEs, and um, we made some reasonable assumptions, assuming that maybe uh, each of them is representative of a third of the entire population. Um, and then we I uh, computed the integral over the TDE population, considering the redshift evolution of the TDE rate, which is negative, it goes like one plus e to the minus three. Um, and I applied some uncertainties, which are the shaded line here. The main uncertainty is related to the uh, lower mass that you can have for the supermassive black hole disrupting the star. Uh, that's not very well known. It can cause a significant uncertainty. So, but here you see, you see our results compared to the ice cube data for the diffuse flux. Um, the central curve is the, our fiducial result. For the X ray based model and for the infrared based model. And the two sets, the ones with the longer error bars, 
uh, and the one with the shorter error bars are two different subsets, um, shower-like events and track-like events. And you see basically that the X-ray based model is good at reproducing the lower part of the spectrum. And the infrared based model is would only reproduce the higher part of the infrared spectrum. So we know for sure that this model cannot account for the entire diffuse space. Um, well, why can't you have both at the same time? Because you have you know you have a spectrum of proton energies and both radiation fields are yeah? yes yes we could say that maybe some uh, maybe the tv population is not that uniform there may be some where uh, uh, this mechanism is predominant and there may be some where this other one is predominant is well, that you're a single one a single a single one will have both x-rays and, and dust perhaps Fred. um yeah we could see if there is something intermediate um, between these two. Uh, let me just clarify that um, for each model, all the photons are included, all the photons wavelengths are included. So when I showed uh, these results, this is an infrared based scenario, but we are including contributions from X rays and optical UV as targets, which are, uh, these are broken down in these curves. So this one, for example, is the infrared contribution. This one is the X-ray contribution. Uh, and it turns out that in this case, in particular, there is significant contribution from the optical UV photons as, as targets. Uh, so, um, but yes, so the point, I, I see that, I hear the message that if our primary goal was to reproduce the diffuse flux, we could probably see if there is uh, some sort of intermediate model or a model where both effects coexist and uh, they, that, that would kind of reproduce the more central, at least the more central part of this. Yeah. So what's the main reason that that would be challenging? And, and so, for example, I would think maybe you would have to lower the normalization of each of the two independently because you have some energetics argument you can have more energy than you see in other bands. But I, is there any other reason, theoretical reason, why you couldn't just have some intermediate model where you lower the left by a factor of two and Let's say. Um, yeah. Geometry isn't. Let me see. So the easiest way to accomplish what you're saying would be to change the cutoff proton cutoff. So you could say, okay, maybe I don't know half of the TV population has a lower energy proton cutoff for some reason, they are not all equal to each other, right? And so th those would account, the lower energy proton cutoff could uh, uh, account for these, and the higher energy, the, the TVs with higher energy proton cutoff could account for these. But within a single TV, hmm. could you just modify the spectrum so proton? And yeah, yes, we could uh, try a number of things. We could try a different proton spectrum. We could change um, the way the photon, the composition of the photon uh, uh, background. Uh, now I regret that I didn't include, uh, we have an intermediate model that I didn't include, uh, but it's kind of intermediate, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like here. Uh, so these are kind of two extremes, but we can play with that. We didn't find, um, unless we take a diverse TV population, we didn't find a single model that reproduces the entire spectrum, but we haven't, we haven't tried that hard. <laughs> so it's, this was not the main goal of our study. But for the black hole for population, I mean, that's the orders of magnitude not known, right? Yes. You would tweak like this normalization. The normalization was set by um, matching the data, but we did check that we didn't exceed the entire TV population. So in fact, we are uh, well below, uh, so if you assume that maybe 10% of all TVs accelerate protons, or even 1% of all TVs accelerate protons, you can still get to this level of normalization. So you, 
would have to, it's, it's sufficient to assume that only a fraction of TVs act as accelerators to reach this um, section. Is, is that? Yeah, just the population level, like we don't know the scatter is too big, it, it, it low mass, or this right, is... right. So, the low mass, especially the low mass cutoff, is being uncertain, would change your your um, TV rate by about an order of magnitude. If you change by a factor of several, the bottom, the lower uh, cutoff, uh, yes, so so there, there is room to play with that. And then since you said that the black hole population ranges from say 10 to the five solar masses to 10 to the eight solar masses, it's something we would expect that TDEs will be very diverse. Right? They will not be all of them behave according to a single model. So uh, I really I know I'm running out of time, but I want to show very quickly the TDs that I have not covered the associations out of the eight that I have not covered so far. These were found in by cross-correlating SDSS and new wide uh, data. Uh, these are infrared flares. This is the infrared uh, light curve, optical UV. Uh, so you see there is no flare. And this is the neutrino arrival time. So these authors pointed out the closeness between the neutrino arrival time and the peak of the flames. Uh, finally, for entertainment, there is another one, uh, which is called ZTF 20 Abrbaye, which we call Barbie. Uh, this is the Barbie TV because of the acronym here. Uh, it's also called AT 2021 LWX. And this was found uh, by searching the ZTF. So it's not a real time. Follow up. It has a strong dust echo, which is this luminosity curve here. And in this case, also the neutrino was observed about 200 days after the optical UV peak. Um, so this attracted our attention, and we put out a paper with mm, its interpretation in terms of our model. So I want to wrap up quickly because I'm running out of time. I got so many questions. Um, so maybe you don't need a summary, uh, but let me just say that um, TDEs were not considered uh, as likely neutrino sources until very recently. But then, because there have been there have been these associations, now they are more interesting, and it's a, a topic that's catching on. Um, they could account for tens of percent of the diffuse neutrino flux at ice cube. Um, and uh, it's interesting to study what are the special features of these TDEs that might be related to neutrino production. So what is it? Is it the fact that they have an infrared echo? Is the fact that they, uh, they are very bright in X-rays? Uh, we don't know, it's still open to interpretation. Um, and you may have broader questions that would warrant future study, for example, are these all these associations all real? Maybe some of them are just uh, random, uh, uh, random and not really uh, causal. Um, are these objects really TVEs? We talked about that already. Um, these questions I already touched upon. Uh, and then ultimately, related to some of the questions I got earlier, if ultimately we get to the point of knowing that TVEs are trillionmeters, what can we learn about? Uh, supermassive black holes, for example, maybe this is something about their spins or about their populations or what type of stars tend to fall into black holes. Uh, so I will stop here. Sorry for going over time. Thank you for your attention. The very last example you showed had three vertical lines or three neutrino events. I went, I went very quickly on this. This is kind of a summary figure of the three ones that I've shown in the, in the previous slides and the new ones. So these Both are the these are the older ones. Green, the green, yellow, and blue are the ones you have seen already in the previous slides. And the green, this uh, red one is the new one. 
And these are all um, in this rest frame of the supermassive black hole so that you can compare luminosities. This one was extremely luminous. It made it into the national news. I think at some point it was CNN or on the New York Times because it was so luminous. And uh, the authors, uh, I believe these authors here, they call it scary Barbie because it's uh, so powerful, so luminous. Um, so yeah, um, just an announcement, um, there's still slots for dinner if anyone wants to join Trulia tonight. Um, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>